All right, let's go. A couple things before we get started here. Number one, we got hacked or spammed by some spammer who created a fake COTR Telegram account. And he tried to trick people out of money by saying they won this Fellowship of the Ring Saga expansion and was asking them to pay for shipping. Carpet of the Rings always pays for shipping. And also, we are not offering a PS5 with this. And and we definitely would not ask you to give us money through Bitcoin. So this is just a general FYI. Be careful of scammers out there. This guy's working really hard to look like us. But COTR would never ask you to pay for shipping, especially through suspicious ways like Bitcoin. Another thing I wanted to talk about was the PODs that I mentioned in the first video, because I've been reading all the comments and there's a little bit of confusion. So I had mentioned that the PODs, the print on demand quests, the old forests and fog on the barrow downs can be played in this saga campaign. They fit right between quests one and two. They actually have a boon in the, each of them that you can earn, but you have to purchase them separately. So here they are on the FFG website. So I just wanted to make sure I was being clear on that. As you can see, they're currently out of stock, so you will have to do some online shopping or local game store finding to try to find these. And sometimes they show up at the game center all right, let's go. Let's start video number two of the Lord of the Rings, the card game, the Fellowship of the Ring Saga expansion. So in this video, I'm going to be looking at the player cards. I'm going to be talking about some common rule questions. And then I'm also going to give some advice on how to beat these quests. All right, so to start out with, let's talk hobbits. We have lots of hobbits. So we are given four hobbit heroes that can be used in any of your deck building, so no matter what quest you're playing, you can use these four hobbits. The Frodo's, plural, <laughs> can only be used when you're playing the Saga expansions because of this. They have the Fellowship Sphere. So these also have the Ring Bearer trait, so they can hold on to the one ring. You can only use these two Frodo's when you are playing the Saga quest. Any Saga quest that says you need a Ring Bearer Frodo, you can use either of these. And as you're playing the campaign, you can swap because it doesn't matter because they have the exact same name. And that is also true for any character that has the same name. For example, if you have the Angmar Awakens expansion, you got Spirit Mary, and this came with Tactics Mary. So in your campaign log, all you're supposed to do is record the name of the hero that you're using. So if you just put down Mary, you can switch between Spirit and Tactics Mary. You don't have to take the plus one threat increase for swapping out heroes when you are not allowed to. You're allowed to swap out heroes at certain points, but when you're playing the next quest and you weren't and you were not allowed to swap out the hero, it's okay to swap out versions of the hero. Okay, so any player card that has a normal sphere, so Tactics, Spirit, Leadership, Lore, Neutral, they can be used in any of your deck building. But you can only use the Fellowship Sphere cards. So these two cards, Frodo's Intuition and the Fellowship of the Ring, which are both amazing, can only be used when you're playing these Saga expansions. All right, let's talk about the cards in general because in the first video I talked about how Sam's ability, you get to ready him and boost his stats when you engage an enemy with a higher threat than yours. This uh, is good, but there are cards that can make it even better. But I want to talk about him for a second. So this stacks, and you also don't have to be exhausted. So it says, after you engage an enemy with an engagement cost higher than your threat, ready Sam Gamgee. And then the next sentence says he gets the stat boost until the end of the round. He doesn't have to be exhausted. It's just a benefit. So if you optionally engage a Black Rider, hopefully... Its threat was higher than yours. You're going to ready Sam. He's going to get boosted. But there's also f effects in the first quest especially that says an enemy might engage you whether you want it to or not. So it is possible to fail a hide test, engage a Nazgul, and then you might decide, I don't know why you would do this, but you might decide to optionally engage another Nazgul that was revealed by uh, a, a later player in the staging step. Uh, my point here is, is if you somehow engage two enemies or three or more, 
Sam keeps getting boosted. It's not limit once. So if you get an enemy engaged with you through some card effect, he would ready, he would get boosted. And then if you engage another enemy, even if you're already ready, he would get boosted again. So you can keep boosting him up. Of course, you're only allowed to optionally engage one enemy. So normally, it's pretty hard to boost him. It has to be through some sort of card effect. But let's talk about that. So he's got plus one defense. Well, that's not really enough. You want to try to get a Hobbit Cloak on him. Now, the rules get this wrong in the rule book. It says you can put a couple on him, but it's limit one per hero, as you can see right there. But it's pretty good. So he gets plus two defense while defending against an enemy with a higher engagement cost than your threat. Um, that's great. So he would be defending for four the round you engage that enemy, which is really good. Defending for four uh, tends to be enough. Um, he only he has three hit points, but if you have build a pony in play, uh, all Hobbit characters get plus one hit point, so that helps. And if you control Sam, build a pony is free, so that makes him an excellent target for a very good tail. If you have the Dwarves of Durin starter set, so a very good tail works very good with any ally that you get to put into play for free. To make sure Sam's ability triggers, we also got this card that is Take No Notice. So it costs three, but it gets a cost reduction of one for every Hobbit or Ranger hero you control. So it's pretty easy to make this thing cost zero. And then each enemy will get plus five engagement costs. So that makes it a lot easier to engage enemies that have a higher engagement cost than yours, especially because Pippin is also boosting engagement costs. So if you control Pippin, and then you have three other hobbits, because you might have Frodo, that's an increase of four, and then you play that, that's an increase of five. You just increased an enemy's engagement by nine, which means you're most likely going to be triggering Pippin and Sam, which is excellent. That's really good. The last way to handle a defense, if you absolutely have to hit a panic button, like maybe attacking enemy makes an additional attack, is if you control Barley, Barlamin Butterbur, uh, if each hero you control has the Hobbit trait, damage from undefended attacks against you may be assigned to Barlamin. I mean, you can even use this as a way to not defend at all. Just don't defend, let the damage go through to Barlamin, and then Sam would be ready and maybe Mary, and you should be able to kill the enemy. But you might not have enough attack to kill the enemy. But there are some ways to boost your attack and defense and willpower. So we got Halfling Determination, just an excellent card. It only costs one tactics, and you get to boost all of your Hobbit stats to the end of the phase. So if you need a willpower push, this helps. If you need an attack push, this helps. And if you need a defensive boost, this helps. Great card. Also, the Dagger of Western A's. You know, in my progression series, this is the card I couldn't wait to get. I mean, it takes a long time just to get what I consider to just be a standard weapon. You attach it to any hero. That, a hero, get, that hero gets plus one attack. It's such a solid weapon. I mean, it's just straight up, okay, great. And then plus two attack if you're attacking an enemy with an engagement cost higher than your threat. There are so many decks that use this weapon. If you have the Elves of Lorien starter set, this works great with Haldir. It really does, because Haldir is most likely attacking enemies that have a higher engagement cost, because you didn't engage it. You know, if you're playing solo, they stay up in the staging area. Then Haldir can do his special attack. And the other card that helps Haldir trigger is Tactics Mary. This is the card I used for most of my Haldir decks in the early game, because his low threat and access to Tactics is excellent. If you watched my video where I wanted to add Tactics to a Haldir deck, and I was only using the starter sets and the core set, I had to use a high threat tactics hero. I had to use Gimli, which works against Haldir. Mary works perfectly with Haldir. So if you've been wanting to build a Haldir deck, which you totally should, because he's awesome, uh, put Mary in it, put some weapons in it, and go. You'll have fun. Uh, last, but definitely not least, is Farmer Maggot. So a nice expensive ally, three cost, one willpower, two attack, two hit points. Two hit points is always so good. Uh, but then he says, when he enters play, deal one damage to an enemy engaged if you two if the engagement cost is higher than your threat. So you can do some uh, planning. So if you've engaged one of these, but you couldn't quite kill it, but you know the next round you're going to be playing Farmer Maggot, well, that's two direct damage. So if you can attack for eight the first time, then Farmer Maggot can scare this Black Rider off. Excellent. Excellent. 
way to handle enemies and very thematic. All right, but in addition to combat, we also started getting some pipe stuff. Now here is one of the best allies in the game, really. Uh, it's a two for two, so he costs two and has two willpower, which is always amazing, and two hit points. So if he's exhausted and you reveal a treachery that says deal a damage to an exhausted character or something, he would live. After Bilbo Baggins enters play, search your, search your deck for a pipe and add it to your hand. Shuffle your deck. Um, he's also a, an ally that you kill off. So if you have a second copy in your hand, he's unique. You always got to pay attention to that unique symbol. You only can have one copy in play. But if you have another copy in your hand and you're still digging for more pipes, um, suddenly he becomes a chump blocker. You die. You kill him off. And then you play another copy to find another pipe. I've definitely done that lots of times. What's the deal with pipes? Well, we got hobbit pipes, and then there's also a wizard pipe I'll be talking about. Uh, the hobbit pipe is free. You still need a sphere match, so you still need somehow to have access to spirit, even if it's a zero-cost card. You attach it to any hobbit character, so Bilbo himself could have a pipe. And then it's limit one, and then after your threat is reduced by an event, exhaust the hobbit pipe to draw a card. It's just really nice, because it's in sphere with spirit which is the sphere with all the threat reduction events. So it, it's awesome to have more card draw in a sphere that's not lore. Excellent, excellent card. You also get a threat reduction event. It's smoke rings, it costs two. And then you reduce your threat by one for each pipe you control. It's not hobbit pipe, it's any pipe. So it doesn't matter if it's a wizard pipe or a hobbit pipe. And then each hero with a pipe gets plus one willpower until the end of the phase. So this is excellent. This is an excellent card to play. Combos perfectly with this. Um, really good. So you are given a lot of willpower boosting cards for your hobbits, which is really good because the first quest you play, that is going to be my advice, is you want to bring willpower boosting cards. Uh, not only do enemies have high threat, you also have these hide tests, which are based on willpower. I'll be talking about that a little bit later, but willpower boosting your hobbits, strongly recommend it. That's all I can think about at the moment for how these hobbits work and the cards you are given. I love playing hobbit decks. Uh, you're, giving, you're given a very good start for how to build a hobbit deck here. The one thing you need to get is you need to get a copy of the Dead Marshes so you can get Fast Hitch. That really makes a hobbit deck sing. So try to find the Dead Marshes so you can get Fast Hitch in this deck. Okay, let's talk about the other hero we got, which is Gandalf. So Gandalf, of course, is amazing. He's a starry. He can play the top card of your deck as if it was in your hand, and he's considered to have the resource icons when he does so. So the way it works, if we assume this is my deck right here, you would play with that card face up. And so then when it's face up in the planning phase, he could play Barlamin, even if you didn't have a lore hero, if you just were playing with Sam and Mary, let's say, you could still play this lore ally. Uh, it's also important to note that because he's considered to have the printed icons, if you're playing a card like the Burning Brand or some other card that says attached to a hero with a specific sphere, he's allowed to play that card on himself because at the time he's playing the card, he's considered to have that sphere match and that printed sphere. And then it's okay that he loses that sphere after you're done playing that card. Once it's attached, it gets to stay. So a Burning Brand can stay on him and any other card that says attached to a specific sphered hero, uh, which, which makes him very powerful, as, as he should be. It's Gandalf. Uh, he also got some nice toys. So Bilbo's back because you want Bilbo to help find your pipe. The Wizard Pipe uh, is amazing. It's really good. So the Wizard Pipe goes on Gandalf or any Astari character. Limit one, and then exhaust the wizard pipe to switch a card in your hand with the top card of your deck. So if you have the Hobbit expansions and you have the ally Gandalf, this could go on that ally Gandalf as well. So you do a switch. You do a swap. So let's say in my hand I have Barlamin and I want to get Barlamin in play. You use wizard pipe, so you would exhaust the wizard pipe, do a swap, and now Gandalf can pay for Barlamin. This is really good, and it's a way to make sure you're getting the right cards where you need it. But where it really comes in play is with his event, the Flame of Anor. It's a neutral. It goes into victory display after you play it. It's a spell. It costs one, 
you add it to the victory display and discard the top card of your deck to ready an Astari character you control. So in this case, unlike Sam, he has to actually be exhausted because that action is to ready the character. Once Gandalf readies, he gets plus X attack until the end of the phase where X is the discarded card's cost. So I think you can see how this works. If you have an expensive card in your hand, like Boromir here, who costs four, you could use Wizard Pipe, put Boromir on top of your deck, play the Flame of Anor, ready Gandalf, and he's going to get plus four attack because you put an expensive card on there. Or if you have a card on your deck that you don't really want to play, like you already have a copy of Barlamin in play, and he's unique, that's a great target for Flame of Anor. It's excellent, and sometimes I don't even need the attack boost. It's I needed to ready Gandalf so he could defend for me or something. So he does have to be exhausted, though, so you got to make sure he's exhausted before you play Flame of Anor. Uh, the last thing is Gandalf's staff, his walking stick. So uh, unique again, only one. Neutral, two cost, it's restricted, and then action, exhaust Gandalf's staff to choose one, Choose a player to draw a card. Add one resource to a hero's resource pool. That's anybody. That could be anybody at the table. Or discard one shadow card from a non-unique enemy. Don't forget non-unique. It can't be a unique enemy. Um, that's excellent. I usually keep Gandalf's staff ready. And then when combat has happened and I know I don't need to discard a shadow card, I then trigger one of those two effects. Really great card. Absolutely excellent. Okay, over on this side, we have the Elf Stone, which I want to talk about. So, great card. Uh, you attach it to the active location. Attached location gets plus one quest point. It's unique. And then, after attached location is explored, the first player puts one ally into play from their hand. So, it's kind of like Sneak Attack, except the ally gets to stay in play, which is really good. So, you need to pay attention to your allies and what they say. So, for example, Bilbo just says when he enters play. So you don't need to play him from your hand. Just when he enters play, find a pipe. Compare that to Galadriel, who says after you play Galadriel from your hand, search the top five cards of your deck for an attachment with a cost of three or less and put it into play. Put the remaining cards back in any order. That would not trigger because you did not play her from your hand. The Elfstone played her. So Galadriel's effect does not work. So she would not be a good target for Elfstone. Elrond, on the other hand, would be decent because after he enters play, choose one, heal all damage from a hero, discard a condition attachment, or each player draws a card. That would trigger, and you would have a powerful ally in, but then at the end of the round, you would discard him from play. But again, it's the end of the round. There's an action window that happens in the refresh phase after he would ready. So once again, a very good tail would be a very good play with this combo. Elfstone in Elrond. Do one of those effects, use him in combat, and then use him for a very good tail. And you don't even need leadership in your deck, because if it's the top card of your deck, Gandalf can play it, because his ability is limit once per phase. Now an excellent ally to get in with Elfstone, because he sticks around, is Boromir. And uh, with his three attack, one defense, four hit points, he's an amazing combat ally. Gondor warrior, but he gets plus two defense. While defending against an enemy with an engagement cost higher than your threat, and then response, after he takes any amount of damage, ready him. So he can defend, and sometimes you just want him to take one point of damage, so then he's ready with his three attack. Uh, excellent ally. And again, all these are unique, so you only can have one copy in play on the table. And that's the last thing I want to say. For Gandalf, uh, he's also unique. So if somebody is running core set Gandalf doing sneak attack Gandalf type stuff you can't if this Gandalf is in play because the unique symbol cancels out any chance for other players to play Gandalf so you are a Gandalf guy and you are stopping other people from playing their core set Gandalf so if somebody does have sneak attack Gandalf in their deck they might want to swap out Gandalfs for another ally that could do something useful maybe Bayorn Okay, and that is all I can think of off the top of my head for the player cards that came with this expansion. Now I'm going to talk about the quests and just give some high-level strategy tips, and then I'm going to give some rule clarifications for playing campaign mode. The biggest deviation from the normal rules when playing any of these quests, whether it's campaign mode or individually, 
is that instead of the players as a group revealing X number of cards in the staging step, each player reveals their own card in the staging step. And that is important because of peril. If the encounter card has the peril keyword, only the player who revealed that card can decide what to do with it. So player one reveals a card, player two reveals a card during the staging step. And if it says peril, nobody can give the player who revealed that card any advice. The player who revealed the peril card must make the decision. If the peril card gives you a choice, and one of those choices is you would get attacked, once you decide that you're going to take the attack, other players can at that point help you. But you can't, according to the rules, say, hey, I'm thinking of taking this attack. Would your sentinel character be able to defend for me? You have to assume that your friend across the table will be able to help you if you take this attack. Okay, so make sure you're paying attention to cards with peril. The other thing, whatever hero has the one ring, which is going to be one of the two Frodo's, this will travel with the first player. So Frodo will be moving around the table, and if you're using Pippin to increase the threat of enemies in the staging area, just remember, if you have Frodo, that gives it an extra plus one, but once Frodo goes with another player, Pippin's ability is one less. It's easy to forget. Speaking of the Hobbits, the first scenario, A Shadow of the Past, everybody likes to play Hobbits, and that's because not only do you get Frodo's Intuition, which is a Fellowship card, you also start the game at Bag End. So after it leaves play, each player draws one card for each Hobbit hero they control. I mean, it's so hard not to play Hobbits against this scenario. Getting massive card draw right off the bat is amazing. The problem, of course, is, and again, this is, I'm just giving some general strategy tips. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the cards if you want to be surprised. Um, is, you know, these Nazgul, they're, they're bad. They're big. And a Hobbit should not be able to kill a Black Rider. You just want to avoid the Black Rider. So when you're playing this quest and you're using Hobbits, think of it more as you're trying to sneak past them. If you do have to engage a Black Rider, and you do manage to kill it, I usually think, I didn't kill it, I just avoided it, and I snuck away. But really, if you can just keep these Black Riders up in staging and just keep questing over them, that is your best bet if you're running Hobbits. You're, you're Hobbits, you're trying to sneak away. Now, the problem is the hide test. So, as you can see, this Black Rider has hide too. So, any card with the hide keyword will trigger the hide keyword if it is revealed. So you need to always assume that you'll have to make a hide test when you're not planning on it. So if you're revealing a card and it has hide, you might have to make a hide test. All right, what is a hide test? So if a card is revealed with the hide keyword, in that case hide two, you're going to have to discard the top two cards of the encounter deck and look at the threat of those two discarded cards. But before you discard the cards, you can exhaust any number of characters and add up the combined willpower of those characters. It's not printed. It can be boosted willpower. Then you're going to compare the two. If your willpower is greater than or equal to the discarded card's threat, you have passed the hide test. Now there is an action window that opens up. So if you discard two cards and you have failed the hide test, you can take an action like play Frodo's Intuition or Halfling Determination to boost your willpower even more to try to beat that hide test. There is a new action window that opens up at that point. If you fail, a lot of bad things happen. In this case, any Nazgul enemy up in the staging area engages you, and then you trigger the forced effect, which is it would make an attack. That's terrible. So you always need to have characters ready to try to pass hide tests. So my advice for this scenario is readying and willpower manipulation. You want to be able to increase your willpower and you want to be able to get action advantage out of your characters with high willpower. My last piece of advice, since this first stage only has one quest point, be careful. Be careful. Don't advance until you're ready. Okay, the second quest is A Knife in the Dark. So you start out in Bree. And my advice for this quest is direct damage because you do start with Bill Fernie in the staging area and he's annoying. You would like to try to kill him, but he's hard to kill. So direct damage is very useful. So sneak attack Gandalf would be great, even though it's not thematic, it would help a lot. And then uh, my general advice for this quest is it gives you the option to shuffle in enemies. And I think you can make the assumption that if the quest is giving you a choice to shuffle in enemies, 
that's going to come back and bite you. So try not to shuffle in enemies if you don't have to, but it's pretty hard to get through it without shuffling in any. It's it's possible, but it it's a hard quest. This is a hard quest. There, there's no doubt about it. I was just thinking about it as I was making this video. It's a very hard quest. It is a quest that when you beat it, you do get some help for your campaign. But yeah, you are going to have a, a difficult time beating this quest. I think it, it's, it surprises me every time I play it how hard this quest actually is. And there is a really nasty treachery. I just want to point it out that each ally gets minus one willpower until the end of the round. Deal two damage to each ally with zero willpower. So power in their terror. Very nasty treachery. Be very careful with your allies knowing that this treachery is in the deck. Okay, the third scenario is Flight to the Ford. So it's a very good scenario. It's very fun. And as it should be, you feel like you are racing. And that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be racing. So some quests I say, hey, turtle, and build up your board state. This is not one of those quests. You're going to start the game with an evil wound and your ring bearer's life is set at 15. And there's constantly effects removing his life. And if he ever gets to zero, you lose. So this evil wound is hurting him, and you're just trying to get out of here as fast as possible. You're being chased by all nine Nazgul, so the nine are abroad, is just an example of one of the terrible treacheries in this quest. You need to move. You just need to move as fast as you can. You need to cross these iconic locations to get to Rivendell to beat the quest. And this quest also has a burden deck. Now, as you can imagine, I'm just going to flip through them fast. These are terrible. These are all terrible. They all have Surge. They're absolutely horrible. And you are given options to add these to the encounter deck. Try not to shuffle more in than you have to. You will have to shuffle in one at least. But if you can avoid shuffling in any more, do so. It, it's very hard though. I mean, don't feel bad if you shuffle in more than one. It, it's going to happen. But this quest is super thematic. It's a race. And it's, it's again, difficult. Most of these quests are very difficult. But I love the theme of it. I love the evil wound counter of you feel like you're literally racing against the ring bearer's life before he turns into a wraith. It's amazing. I love it. Great quest. Super well done. Okay, the fourth quest is the ring goes south. This is my favorite quest of the entire game. I absolutely love this quest. You don't even have to play it campaign mode to love it. Just, you know, bring it to the table with a group of new players, and it's a fantastic quest. You start with the, the Council of Elrond, which is just extremely fun, and you get you know a free card, and it's you have good discussion. If you're playing solo, it's fun. Four player, it's fun. And it's I'm just gonna say it's fun one more time. It's very fun. I really like it. Uh, playing campaign mode, you also get some really nice iconic items that I'm sure you recognize. And this quest is also very thematic. So. It has this mechanic where you're trying to sneak around. So you have to travel to a location. And then as you can see on this forced effect, after an enemy engages a player, place one damage on the active location if able. So you're constantly damaging these locations, which is supposed to represent how you're sneaking around. And if we look at the tree crowned hill, it says when it is explored, the players as a group exhaust X characters in play. X is the number of damage here. So all the locations are like this. So when you explore them, you look at the damage that you placed on it, and it'll tell you to do something terrible. Uh, super thematic. You're fighting wargs. You're making it to the Watcher in the Water. You have to get through the Doors of Durin. I mean, the whole thing is just a thematic masterpiece. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's definitely not as hard as some of the other quests contained within this expansion. And that's why I like playing it with new players. It's extremely well done. It's extremely fun. And as I said, the Council of Elrond is just a blast. Okay. The next quest is A Journey in the Dark, which is difficult, but thematic. Holy cow, is this a thematic quest. So we all know what the dwarves awoke in the darkness of Khazad Doom. So we know what's coming back here, right? So this quest has a counter. Doom, Doom, Doom is counting down. Durin's Bane is getting closer and closer to you. And you're once again moving fast. This is another quest where hanging around for too long is not great. You have a lot of progress to get through on the quest stages because you're sneaking through the mines. There's a lot of archery in this quest. The enemies aren't nice. So you have archery, you have direct damage, 
and it, it's very hard. This is a hard quest. You will be tested. I mean, there's a treachery, for goodness sakes, called Fool of a Took. How cool is that? And yeah, there's some burdens. These burdens are some of the worst burdens in the game. So this is a hard quest. You're definitely going to want to bring the power. This isn't like uh, the very first quest, Shadow of the Past, where you're trying to sneak past the enemies. Uh, this one, you're definitely going to fight the enemies, and you're definitely going to try to kill them. It's awesome, thematic, and the ending of this quest is always epic. There's a lot of stories within the community of the epicness that happens at the end of this quest. Uh, this is extremely well done. All right, the final quest that you will play is the Breaking of the Fellowship. Aww. So the Breaking of the Fellowship is great. You start off in Lorien. You have boons that you can get, which are also very thematic and very fun. And then uh, you are being hunted by the uruk -hai, and the uruk -hai have a new keyword. It's tough. Tough is so annoying. This uh, quest, in addition to having lots of direct damage with archery, you also have a hard time killing these guys. So in this case, Toughness 1 means that when this enemy is attacked, the first point of damage he would take is canceled. And so you might be thinking, well, how's that different than just increasing his defense by one? Well, if you're using like a Gondorian Spearman, it does nothing. Like the Gondorian Spearman's effect just gets canceled. So it really slows down direct damage. And I think you'll see just how annoying this tough keyword is. And as you can see, um, these enemies are, are not pushovers. They're not slouches. They're very evil. This also has, to represent the breaking of the fellowship, multiple staging areas. So there's multiple stage threes. And if you're playing a multiplayer game, each player will be going to one of these stage threes. And the rules do a really nice job explaining how the multiple staging areas work. So I would give, definitely give this a good read, but the long and short of it is you're at different staging areas. Each player does their own staging. Each player is responsible for their own threat increase if they under quest. They only can engage enemies in their own staging areas. However, since if you've read the book and seen the movies, you know the characters are all running around trying to help each other, you can still use Sentinel, you can still use Ranged, and you can still use cards that interact with other players. You just can't help each player quest. And you can't optionally engage enemies that are in the other player's staging areas. So uh, make sure you give this a read, but I really like that even though you're at multiple staging areas, you can still kind of help each other. Uh, that's very, very fun. This is a very thematic quest, and it's really well done. And it's hard. I'm just going to kind of, that's kind of my mantra, is these quests are all difficult, but fun. All right, let's take a look at some of the campaign rules. We have a couple keywords, permanent and setup. And so you will be adding cards at the setup of a game permanent. So... There are cards that get permanently attached to a hero. They cannot be removed. So if you reveal a card that says discard an attachment you control, you cannot discard something that has the permanent keyword. And then as you play, you will be earning boons and burdens. So if you've earned the burden Gandalf's Delay, you would start with this in play. And this is one of the few cards that I have found with any sort of change. This now says skip the draw card step during the first round of the game. It used to be you only drew five cards in your opening hand. So this really screws over Aristor, which I'm fine with. But yeah, that's, that's a big difference. So if you're playing with, with uh, Lore Bilbo or Aristor, that is a big change. And this would start the game in play. But you need to be careful because as you play quests, it will tell you which boons and burdens to include. So sometimes it'll tell you not to include any burdens with this symbol. That doesn't mean it's removed forever. It could come back. So you always have to look at the setup instructions on your campaign card to see which boons and burdens are coming and going. Uh, so just because one scenario might remove a burden, it doesn't mean it can't come back. So you need to reread every scenario setup instructions to see which boon and burdens to include. Now some boons will say add it to the victory display. So Mr. Underhill says if you use him, add him to the victory display. This has the permanent keyword. So you're supposed to start the game with this in play. If you trigger it and add it to the victory display, this will come back in the next scenario. You just added it to the victory display. You did not remove it from the campaign pool. So it's important to remember that there is a campaign pool. The campaign pool includes the boons and burdens. So if a card just says add it to the victory display, that card is still in the campaign pool. 
Let's compare that to leaf wrapped lembus. Leaf wrapped lembus says add leaf wrapped lembus to the victory display and remove it from the campaign pool. So that means this is a one and done. You get to use leaf lap <laughs> you get to use leaf wrapped lembus one time in your entire campaign and then it's gone for the rest of the campaign. So eat your lembus wisely, but it's very important to pay attention to the difference between those two wordings. I talked about this earlier, but I'll say it again. If your heroes include a hero that has multiple versions of the hero, that does not count as swapping out the hero. You can start with Tactics Mary, and you can swap it into Spirit Mary, and you will not take the plus one threat increase. But if you, for example, between quests two and three, decide you want to add a different hero, you would have to raise your threat by one. You are given times to exchange heroes for no threat penalty. One of the times is between quests three and four. When you start quest four, you are allowed to pick different heroes and you will not get a plus one threat increase for doing so. So pay attention to that. This is the only time in these six scenarios when you can change out your heroes for free when playing campaign mode is between the completion of quest three, Flight to the Ford, and the start of quest four, the ring goes south. That's when you're allowed a free hero swap. Now, one thing that is a little frustrating is this tells you to look at pages 28 to 30 of the Learn to Play book included in the core set. It's really included in the new core set. My core set rules do not include campaign mode. So I actually don't have that. I can't even show it to you because I don't have the new core set. So you're going to have to go online to read those if you don't have the new core set, if you have one of the old core sets. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video and the brief overview and some tips and tricks on how to play with the player cards and how to hopefully defeat these quests. Again, I absolutely love these quests. I love how thematic they are. I have played these quests so many times in campaign mode and also just standalone. Uh, they're really, really well done, and I'm sure you're going to have a great time with them. All right, everybody. Up next is going to be a video where I am playing my favorite quest. I'm going to play The Ring Goes South. And I'm really looking forward to recording that video for you guys. Take care, everybody. Don't forget to comment on the first video if you want to win a copy of this. Actually, if you want to win this copy right here, you'll get this one. I will be announcing the winner in the Ringo South video that I will be putting out in the near future. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.